and the exits. If you go out this door, you're gonna get locked in. So go out this door if you feel so inclined if you need to exit. Uh, before we get to the questions that are gonna hopefully help y'all determine who you're gonna be supporting this election season, I wanna take to a moment to recognize all of the organizations, businesses, nonprofits, and wonderful people who came together to make this night happen. District B is a large and a very diverse swath of New Orleans. It's comprised of several police districts, neighborhood organizations, and advocacy groups. It's quite a feat that we were able to bring together so many invested and active people. So as I call out your name or your organization, uh, please wave, say hello, and be recognized. Um, I haven't seen Commander here, but 1st District, New Orleans Police Department. Let's give it up. Avery's <laughs> on two lanes. Carol Cesaria Necker. Crescent Care. Friends of the Lippy Greenway. Greater Mid-City Business Association. Mid-City and Uptown Messenger. The Mid-City Neighborhood Organization. Mid-City Security District. Parkview Neighborhood Organization, Health Print, Preservation Resource Center, Three Palms Bar and Grill. Thank you so much for bringing the food tonight. Two Lane Banks Neighborhood Association, Two Lane Canal Neighborhood Association, Two Lane Canal Neighborhood Development Corporation. And if I missed anybody, I'll see you in a couple hours. <laughs> A special shout out to Uptown and Mid-City Messenger for filming and live streaming tonight on their page. And thanks to all the volunteers and committee members who helped make tonight happen. So once again, please join me in thanking all the folks that made this happen today. A huge thank you to coming out to our moderators and of course our candidates. We're gonna get started here in a few minutes with our moderators, but first, back to you, Patrick. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. I'm here to introduce our moderators for the evening. Uh, first up, uh, we have Claire Bayan, from, uh, an energetic reporter from the Mid-City Messenger. She has experience through a variety of news outlets throughout the South and covers a variety of topics from controversial developments to wild boars. She's been instrumental <laughs> in helping all of our neighborhood organizations get important information out to the community. Graham Bosworth, judge, is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and Suffolk University Law School. His successful law career has sent him through to serve as a prosecutor with the DA's office, and he has argued in front of the U.S. Fifth District Circuit Court of Appeals. He has previously appointed judge pro tempore of the Criminal District Court and is the former president of the Mid-City Neighborhood Organization. Graham now has his private law practice in the city. <laughs> Kathy McRae. Kathy is a graduate of Michigan Technology University, where she earned a degree in geological engineering. She and her family moved to New Orleans in 1996, and she eventually became a vice president in Shell Oil's Deepwater Production Division. Retiring in Mid-City, Kathy is a member of United Way's Board of Trustees, as well as serving as the Women United Chairperson. She serves on the board of Parkview Neighborhood Association and is a longtime volunteer with SVP, formerly the St. Bernard Project. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for our moderators for this evening. Candidates, thank you all for coming. Um, you will each be given one minute for introductions. Following that, a series of questions will be asked. All of our candidates will be provided these, have been provided these uh, questions prior to the debate. The candidates will have one minute to respond to each question. If the responding candidate challenges the platform of another candidate within his or her answer, the challenged candidate will be allowed 30 seconds to respond. A timekeeper is present. He will hold up a red and yellow paddle. When the yellow paddle is raised, the candidate has 15 seconds remaining. When the red paddle is raised, the candidate is out of time. A bell will also ring to alert the candidate that the time has expired. If during the forum any moderator feels that a candidate has not answered a question adequately, he or she may follow up and allow a response not to exceed 30 seconds. 
We will ask as many questions as time permits, but as we near the end of the forum, we will each allow, or excuse me, we will allow each candidate one minute to close. Do all the candidates understand the rules? Any questions? I didn't get any questions. You did not get any questions? No. That's all right, I'll move. All right. All right. All the candidates other than <laughs> Mr. Uh, is it Strumier? Strumier. Strumier have uh, been provided the question. All right, with that. Some people got the questions early, some people got it late. But uh, I guess uh, I'm going to one of the uh, uh, forums. I uh, can, I guess, interpolate and extrapolate in the end, you know. Okay. I'm disagreeing with Andre. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Get that, get that on. All right, with that said, we will begin. setting new priorities for city government, but the elevation of one budgetary priority means dialing back somewhere else. Name one part of New Orleans government you think needs a higher priority and more funding, and name a part of New Orleans government you think is getting too many resources. Mr. Banks. Did you want us to go through and introduce ourselves? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you're not doing that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to go back into the Yeah. Yes. Yes. And this is the part where you get a minute for introduction. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. I am J.H. Banks, and I am a candidate for City Council District B. And just briefly, I am a lifelong resident of New Orleans. I am 57 years old, married, and uh, work in District B every day. I'm the director of the Drive Line City School of Commerce. I'm in the community working, trying to educate people and help them improve their quality of life. I have experience being in the city council. I was the chief of staff of two city council presidents, and I'm holistically committed to trying to make New Orleans be as best as it can be. I would sincerely appreciate you all listening to all that we have to say tonight. And at the end of the night, if you have any questions for me, I would love to be able to answer them. I am intent on making sure that I hear the people's voices and I'm the kind of councilman that you will be proud of. I'm J.H. Banks, and my number on the ballot is number 64. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me to this farm here. My name is Eugene Ben. I've been in New Orleans since the storm. I came here under the two leaders, FEMA and the New York City Housing Authority to do infrastructure development for the city of New Orleans. I've been here for the last 12 years. My wife is from New Orleans. I have four kids and two grandchildren. I am a member of the Central City Housing Development Corporation. I'm also a member of the... Um, of uh, a housing alliance in New Orleans that basically does uh, workforce redevelopment and prison reentry with the sheriff uh, city of New Orleans. I'm also a member of the Central City Partnership and a member of the Collaborative. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Seth Bloom, and thank you to all the organizers for putting this together tonight. Uh, I'm enthusiastically running for District B. Um, locally, I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I've worked in that field for about 14 years. Some of my passions are criminal justice reform, bringing leadership to City Hall, and of course bringing transparency and trying to make, me, trying to make a more efficient government. I served on the Orleans Parish School Board for eight years from 2008 to 2016, two years as the chair, and I hope to take that same kind of energy to City Council to help improve New Orleans. I sit on a number of boards, philanthropy boards, education boards around the city, so I'm hoping that that experience and that insight will help me guide me on City Council. I really appreciate everyone having me out tonight. Thank you so much. So my name is Catherine Love, and obviously I'm up here because my next goal is to be a district B councilwoman. And I'm not going to give you a rundown of my bio or my resume because you can get that on my website and it's on my push cards. But I do want to talk about what sets us apart and what you need to know to make sure that once we're elected, we serve you and not our own self-interest, not political interest, and not special interest. And there are two candidates, one that's not here yet, that have comprehensive platforms with specific action plans. And the reason that is important 
is because it creates a to-do list that you can hold us accountable for. It's also transparency. So we're, we're, when we're in front of one set of audience, we can't spin or change our platform. We're held accountable to what we stand for and how it affects you. And the last thing it demonstrates, that I, we, we have already accepted the willingness to do the job before we've been rewarded with the position. And I will tell you, if people are not willing to work for you now, when they desperately need your vote, how, how hard do you think they're gonna work for you when they don't need anything from you? So I'm here because I'm committed to serve you. I'm committed to 100% transparency and 100% accountability. Catherine Love, number 67. Hello everyone, thank you for coming out tonight. I'm Dr. Andre Strumer, Action Andre. I'm running for city council. These fine public servants up here, I'd love to share this stage with people. I'm uh, number 69 on your ballot. I've been living in the Irish Channel since I got to New Orleans for a permanent residence uh, in 2005, so I've been here a little over 12 years, 63 days before the storms. Uh, block captain of my area, I've been reaching out from 4th Street and helping the Irish Channel move forward over the last dozen years, and I expect to do the same thing for the rest of District B e and the city of New Orleans in general. I fell into public service because I had a calling after being block captain and making sure the crime removed off of our streets in, in my neighborhood. It seemed like the next step what I could be to help and move forward with other people and help reduce crime because it seems that we all want to have safer streets and it seems like a, an easy thing for us to do. We put our minds together, roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thank you very much for coming out and supporting us. All right, after that initial hiccup, we are now going to start with the first question. Second time around, sorry guys. Okay, so council candidates uh, often talk about setting new priorities for city government, but the elevation of one budgetary priority means dialing back somewhere else. Name one part of New Orleans government you think needs a higher priority and more funding, and name a part of New Orleans government you think is getting too many resources. I'll start with you, Mr. Banks. I believe the part of the government that is woefully underfunded is youth activities and involvement. I sincerely believe that if you don't give these young people some constructive, structured activities, give them a direction, give them some foundation, then they end up doing things that we don't necessarily want them to do. And if I get to the city council, that would be a priority of mine to try to ensure that there are resources available to enhance what we currently have and expand those youth programs. Now, where I think we spend too much is on incarceration. We need to be dealing with crime from the front end. Once you deal with them back end, it's too late. Now, it costs much less to educate somebody than it does to incarcerate them. And I think that we need to look at doing it differently than what we're currently doing. I, I came here to do a constructive development of the city. I am still doing that. Um, my hat is, uh, that I'm gonna throw in the field has also to do with uh, Programs that basically advance the cause of the younger people and basically also affordable housing. I think uh, I think since Katrina, we are still short of nearly 30, uh, 34,000 or 37,000 uh, units in the city. And I think that the idea of us not looking at tax dedications from the city, uh, what, which is really un, under the uh, office of the mayor, basically leaves us uh, underfunded with programs that are really necessary to basically put a uh, vision forward for people in New Orleans who we're gonna serve on the team. So I am very in much uh, with affordable housing and uh, programs that basically uh, foster the vision of youth. Thank you. I guess one of the tragedies of the city budget is that we have to dedicate so much money to public safety and still we're not getting the job done. So I guess in a perfect world, I'd like to see more dollars carved out to go towards things like early childhood development and actually preparing and preventing these people and individuals and students and young people from actually getting into the criminal justice system. Um, I've seen this many times across New Orleans and across the country. It's a, it's a terrible epidemic and I think supporting early childhood development, making sure that when kids go to kindergarten they have 2,500 to 3,000 word vocabularies versus 5, 700 word vocabularies where they're always starting back. And I think programs like that and the long-term investment things of that nature will actually make it possible that we can cut back on things like public safety. But right now, uh, public safety is still a very important thing. So, sorry, go ahead, 
So I find this to be a difficult question to answer because there's such a lack of transparency. Do we really know how the money's being spent? Do we really know where our surpluses are? Are the funds really limited? Or are they being misappropriated? So I think there needs to be more transparency so we can really dive in and reallocate resources where we're going to have the greatest impact. You'll hear a lot of talk sometimes about programs that sound really nice, really pretty words that have no impact on our daily lives, have no impact on improving our, our, our citizens' lives and our future. And I think that's where I would like to focus, and one of those in particular is education. I find it extremely tragic that we have six universities in the city, and it has absolutely no impact on the average income and the average education of our citizens. You go to some, a town as small as Fayetteville, Arkansas, and there's a huge impact because there's one university there. So I think we need to dump a lot more resources into our education, and I think those resources are available, but I think we need to look into um, finding areas where they're being misappropriated. Well, currently, our jails and prisons take up too much of our money. We can't arrest our way out of this problem. If we could, we'd have the straight, safest streets in the world. We'd be living in Singapore, and we don't. And we don't have the worst people in the world. Because this is New Orleans. But we have the highest incarcerated per capita population in the world. And that's just not the way it's supposed to be. And the tragic part is that once these people get out of prison, they have nowhere to go. And there is a remarkably small amount of prison reentry programs for our citizens returning from inside. Currently, I've been doing some fantastic work with the woman who's doing the only prison reentry program for women in New Orleans out in the East. We need to have something for these people to have as a sustainable place to return back to our society. Jobs, housing, and just basically friends and family to come back to. Otherwise, they're just going to go back inside. on homelessness. Despite many successful city initiatives over the last 48 years, homelessness is still a critical issue in New Orleans. For residents of District B, this issue is most visible underneath the Claiborne overpass and the Pontchartrain Expressway. Between the UMC and VA hospitals and new development along Canal Street, the city will be pressured to do something about the homeless, which usually means have the NOPD harass them until they go somewhere else. How do you approach the issue of homelessness, and what can City Council do to address the root problems forcing people to live on our streets, to deliver services to help these individuals find treatment or shelter in positive ways, and to do so while respecting their human dignity and rights? And we're going to start with Mr. Ben, please. It is nice that you talk about human dignity and rights because when anyone who was uh, basically dri driven past the uh, eyesore that we have in New Orleans is really surprised that uh, close to 70% of those people actually are veterans who have served their country. And on a daily basis, uh, they have to basically be afforded the uh, displeasure of having the New Orleans uh, Police Department basically ask them to move. Um, we need to be proactive in the city of New Orleans. We are a city of under half a million people. We're making a lot of money from tourism. Uh, we're dedicating taxes to, to, to other areas and avenues, but basically for, forgetting, forgetting people who basically are an integral part of our society. So what we need to do basically is that when we look at the budget, we have to start to look at those particular issues, how we dedicate money to resources to fund housing for people who are homeless, and basically create programs that are uh, resuscitated programs that allow those people basically to uh, resuscitate themselves back into industry. Thank you. Thank you. Homelessness is a multifaceted problem in New Orleans and all across the country. And I think you have to start with getting to the bottom line of it, and that's mental illness and drug addiction. So I think programs like the low barrier shelter that hopefully are going to happen at the old VA hospital, where we can triage these people, we can look at the root of the problem and see whether they have mental illness whether they have drug addictions or whether they're actually committing a crime. 
Uh, I'm 100% behind treating people fairly and giving people dignity. We shouldn't just be sending people on one-way bus tickets. We have to be better as a society and actually look to, to solve these problems. Uh, there's all sorts of progressive policies like in programs they're doing in uh, Chicago right now where they're actually taking these people from their low barrier shelters and integrating them uh, as city ambassadors. So there's all sorts of progressive ideas that we can look to other places. Homelessness is something that exists across the world. Uh, and actually in other cities we have larger, larger homeless problems than we do. And it's not just an optics problem. Uh, it actually has an economic impact. I was talking to some people over the port of New Orleans a couple weeks ago. We lost two Disney cruises uh, because of that. And that's a huge economic impact to the city. Thank you. So I'm going to piggyback on Seth because I think understanding why they're on the streets is important. Many of them are there because of mental health issues. Some are escaping abuse. Others are transiently there because they've lost their home temporarily. Um, and this often gets confounded with drug abuse because they self-medicate. So re replacing the services that have been taken away, that address mental health, that address having a place to go when you're fleeing abusive homes or abusive situations, that provide services to keep these people off the street is step number one. There will always be a small portion of the population that is just not gonna integrate, and then it's providing services that keep them safe on the streets and keep us safe on the streets and limits the economic impact by maintaining their dignity as well. So we do need the shelters, we do need progressive research uh, resources and, and, and programs that will help the ones that are able to integrate. And as a military brat, I mean, seeing veterans on the street, those are the ones that always get my money. So they go and they sacrifice their lives and they come back here and they have nothing. And I think it's important that we provide services for them specifically. All right, first of all, good evening. I always thought that's what being late. We had never even been where we're coming from, so I'm just happy to be here. My name is Timothy David Gray. I'm number 68 in the ballot candidate for the city council and district B as well. No stranger to MCNO. It's a many of your events and your neighborhood meetings that you have most months. I'm usually there. So I'm happy to be here. Um, you know, I've been very vocal in the past about uh, homelessness. Uh, we have this pattern in our, in our city of moving people from Duncan Plaza, from underneath the Interlock Expressway, the interstates, especially during peak tourist seasons or during special events. Um, but I believe we need more long-term solutions. One of those things is transient housing. Some cities have transitional housing that they uh, provide and, and offer to homeless victims, people who fall victim to homelessness. It helps them to uh, have some place to live in the short term while um, they can have job training and, and other sorts of educational skills and also receive health care. That's one aspect of it. The other, though, we have many homeless people who have mental health issues, and those have to be addressed separately. And I believe, um, I think we're out, out of time on that one. <laughs> but there's also one thing I do want to add to that. There's a, there's a need for LGBTQ housing. Oh, there's a homelessness for that, too. So. What I've been seeing on the TV with some of the mayoral candidates, television commercials, is just obscene how they're picking on the homeless people because they're an eyesore, and I find that absolutely anathema. Homelessness and mental illness and drug addiction, they go hand in hand. I mean, I know from personal experience, when I lose my house keys, I'm in a panic. Can you imagine how horrible it is to lose your home? How could that not possibly affect your mental capacity to live and do things? low barrier home project that we have on Perdido Street that both Councilwoman uh, Head and Councilwoman Cantrell have put forth is a fantastic idea that we can continue. People will be able to get in there. We just sweep it out and turn on the air conditioner and it's ready to go. We can have social services, mental health programs, beds, food, and be able to gradually watch these people come back into society, see that they have the resources that they need to move forward and then gradually some of those will move out, some of those will stay in for more heavy medication and training and, and care, and we'll be able to keep that moving. But we need to address this as a real serious thing, that it's not a stigma to have mental illness or a drug addiction. Thank you. Homelessness is a multifaceted problem that does not have a simple solution. Many of those people out there are out there for various reasons, drug addictions, mental health issues, and some in some economic situations. 
the low barrier shelter is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful portion of the solution, but it's just a part of it. We've also got to make sure that we provide wraparound services to help with the abatement of the drug addictions, to help with the social steps that they need to reintegrate. Now, it's unfortunate that many people want to make them uh, a campaign issue to capitalize on, and that, I, I agree with Andre. That is very distasteful to me, because I assure you that not very many of those people who are on the street choose to be. And it ought to tug at every heart out there when you see somebody, but for the grace of God, go out. Because you don't know for sure why they're there. But it's a multitude of reasons. And I am committed to making sure that we provide enough <coughs> social services support to try to alleviate the problem. All right, our next question is on public safety. Several years ago, voters in Orleans Parish demanded the Orleans Parish prison remain a smaller facility. Through civic activism and our representation on the city council, the people rejected the idea of a large jail. And yet there's been a fight every year around budget time regarding the size of the OPP or OJC. Recently, there's been yet another push to add space to incarcerate more individuals, which is already well over capacity. What is your position on the most recent proposed jail expansion? which proposes to construct an additional 89-bed mental health jail, as well as create 400 beds for temporary overflow. Will you commit to upholding the 1,438-bed cap of the jail and opposing these two jail expansion uh, excuse me, proposals? And we will start with Mr. Blue. Uh, this is a topic that I'm intimately concerned about, being someone that criminal justice reform is so close to my heart. And I think jail size, you know, we got all this money and built this beautiful jail and, and now don't know what to do with it other than to fill it, I think is a major societal problem. I'm happy to see that uh, more and more people are not being incarcerated and they're given summons for simple crimes. I'm also like to see it expand to have more mental health beds, but I don't think that means increasing the overall number of beds within the jail. I think I'd like to see us stay at that number, but increase the regular criminal section and have more mental health treatment, have more educational facilities. I'm happy to say that a program I brought in from the, from the school board, that's the Travis Hill School, that same CEASC, CEASS service has now been hired and won the RFP at the OJC, formerly the OPP. And, <laughs> it's alphabet soup, right? But, but this program is fantastic. And you know, when I toured the jail a couple years ago, and I've been there a few times uh, as a visitor, uh, when, when, I went, when I went there, uh, the, the, the actual area that's set up for mental health and for education is, is, is completely lacking. So I am off. I got to to show the love. Um, so I am also for maintaining the smaller size, the current size, the 1400 bed size. Um, what I think we need to do is really look at who's in jail and why they're there. There are plenty of nonviolent criminals and very young nonviolent criminals that can be re rehabilitated and made wonderful members of society. There are plenty of examples across the world where people get a second chance and they make a huge impact on our community. Leaving them in jail does not do any of us any good. And just increasing, and, and I say that with a grain of salt because if you're gonna be a violent criminal, there's a place for you. But I think the size we have is enough to house the ones we have. We need to clean out the jail and make sure that the ones that are there are the ones that need to be there. And I do agree with Seth. There needs to be more um, resources for re-entry, re-education, um, providing them opportunities to rehab and reintegrate into society, as well as mental health. So my position on uh, the jail expansion <laughs> Are we back? Okay, good. Uh, so my, my position on this is kind of um, shaped by a few visits to the jail. I've done several tours of the facility and I've experienced different things uh, during all those tours. Um, I support reducing the size of our jail and doing that through a number of ways. Firstly, uh, reclassifying petty crimes like minor drug possession. Uh, that should not be something that, that automatically lands you in jail. I think having too many traffic or parking tickets should not be something that lands you in jail. 
Uh, nor do I think we should upkeep the practices of holding people in jail just to uh, have longer hours so which to fill the state and, and those who pay for that. So I don't support that. But I uh, have seen firsthand when the inmate tried to jump from a second floor of a tier, or the second story of a tier. Uh, and he's an inmate who's had mental health issues and he suffered uh, with those issues and was in a population amongst other inmates who did not have mental health issues. I support advocates of mental health who say we need to have another facility which to hold them in a place where those deputies can be trained and be in safer environments uh, with just, how much time do you get? <laughs> As I was saying just a moment ago, we have a big enough prison system it's not doing its job as it is to keep ourselves safe. It's, we don't need more beds, we don't need a bigger jail, and we certainly don't need to put people who are mentally ill in prison. I thought we sorted that out at the end of the 19th century. This is not what we're gonna do. We need to get people who are criminals, and I mean violent criminals, they need to go in jail. Nonviolent criminals don't need to go in jail, because right now, somebody who's arrested for $20 worth of pot or shoplifting candy, goes in jail and stays there for 87 days on average before standing tall before the bench in Muni Court. What, what, that is absolutely ridiculous. You're in prison for 30 days, before, I mean, before 90 days before you even get a chance to get out for a minor offense. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then to put people who are mentally ill in jail is just an, another problem. That's not gonna solve the problem of getting these people the help they need, which is mental illness treatment, psychological, psychopharmacological drugs, things that are gonna get them back to being stable members of society. Thank you. If you build it, they will come. So the bigger the jail, the more bodies have to be in it to fill it up. I don't support the expansion. What I do support is not having nonviolent criminals locked up, as Andre said, indefinitely for very minor offenses. Jails ought to be to get violent offenders off the street. People that are gonna hurt one of us ought to be confined where they cannot do that. Now, as it relates to people who have mental health issues, I don't believe just because you have a mental health issue, you are a criminal and ought to be locked down with regular criminals. I don't know if there's enough room in the current facility or how it's configured, but there has to be a way to be able to separate a portion of the jail that's already there, to segregate it for issue in, in, inmates that have mental health issues. They don't need to be in general population, but they need to have the special care that they need. So no, I would not export an expansion, but a reallocation of what we currently have. I agree with uh, Mr. Banks. Uh, <clears throat> I don't support uh, an expansion of the jail system. I currently work with the uh, current sheriff on the prison reentry or force redevelopment program. Uh, we should be able to basically um, have uh, a system where people who have mental issues are uh, incarcerated in separate, in, in separate parts of the prison, and people who are doing uh, hard crimes are in, in uh, separate sections of the prison system. We cannot uh, begin, begin to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But all, it's all a system of being proactive. So why do we have uh, uh, a city with uh, less than uh, five, uh, half a million people? with basically uh, the number one rate of incarceration in the city, you know, in, in the United States. What are we doing? Are we, are, are we looking for solutions to basically create workforce redevelopment and we look for solutions in crime so that basically we don't keep on filling up prisons and jails. So it, it comes from us being reactive and looking for solutions that basically don't have people who are, uh, are the least deserving in our, in, our, in our society ending up in jail in the first place. I think what we heard was almost universal, universally that you all don't support an expansion, but I think the question that was presented was, would you publicly commit on the record to upholding the 1,438 uh, bed size? And I think that's what we were trying to shoot for. And if we could just get yes or no questions across the board. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Ben? Mr. Ben? Yes. Agreed. Yes. Ruin? Yes. No. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree with expanding anything. Will you commit to upholding the 1438 sites? Yes. Okay. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a yes on that one also. We got you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to move on to infrastructure. This is a fun question uh, about sewage and water board, so buckle up. 
<laughs> um, so after years of fighting with FEMA over flood maps, uh, New Orleans finally got many areas moved to lower risk pools for flood insurance. Then on July 22nd and August 5th, the city was hammered with rain that flooded cars, homes, and businesses. District B ended up with a lot of that damage. While rain can overwhelm our capacity to move water, part of the reason flooding was so bad was that the sewage and water board pumping stations were not working the way they needed to be. What do you think is the most critical infrastructure issue facing the sewage and water board? And what will you do about it if elected to city council? I get the loaded question on the back. <laughs> so, again, this is a difficult question to answer because the president of the Sewage and Water Board, after eight years, still cannot tell us to the day what our current state of affairs are. And how can you fight for adequate FEMA funding? How can you fight for anything when you don't know what you're fighting for? So, and then on top of that, city council has been removed from Sewage and Water Board. So we don't have enough oversight, we don't have enough control, and that needs to be replaced, in my opinion. What I would actually like to do is hire somebody who functions as a CEO, and then have a board of directors. I'd like to change the criteria for some of the eligibility. We need to have people that have the expertise to function as experts for the sewage and water board. And it needs to be 100% transparent, 100% accountable. But the first thing we need to do is do a survey and figure out how bad things are. Because there's a lot of redundancy that has been lost over the years. So the systems always worked on redundancy. So if one turbine failed, we had backups. We don't have that anymore. So I think the most critical, sorry, I think the most critical issue facing the sewage and water board right now is our drainage infrastructure. Uh, the system was designed back in like around World War One. It has seen relatively uh, little uh, upgrade or overhaul since then. Uh, it's evident because it continues to fail. It fails not only during storms but just during natural rain. Uh, it fails even uh, just on, on isolated streets. Not even there's a system as over the city. Um, so what you have, if you have my my push card, my uh, campaign policy information in there, bullet points about that. And back in March, I began talking about how we can fix it, what we can do about it on the council. One of those things is begin to lay the groundwork for overhauling our system. That means raising capital, raising some bonds to have money to overhaul our system. It's not something you can do in four years because it costs too much. I think we have to start it now. And back in March, when I began speaking about this, we had flooded twice in ten days. But it has to be something that's on the radar of the next council because the city is approaching 300 years. We should have a drainage system that's reflecting something similar to that. Right now, there is a lack of management at the Sewage and Water Board. There's nobody in charge. Not only is there nobody in charge, but there are 350 jobs that are empty. There are 350 people who could have work for the city with the jobs that are available, that's not even creating any new jobs, that's jobs that are empty right now. One of the problems is that the Sewage and Water Board and Public Works stopped letting the workers do overtime. So once 40 hours hit, they had to stop. If they were in the middle of something, they had to stop or get reprimanded for working after they were not going to get paid. And when that happens, the work doesn't get done. So the problem is that the city has to go out and hire private contractors to finish the work that come back and charge the city twice as much money. A person who starts at the sewage and water board starts at $10 an hour. After two years, it's at 12. After three, after 60, after 15 years, the person's at $16 an hour. Now the person that's holding the stop and slow sign, that person makes $25 an hour on his first day working for a private company. The person at sewage and water's been there 15 years gets $24 if he's allowed to do two and a half, a uh, time and a half, which he's not allowed to do anymore. Let the people work for the city. They want to. I am not an engineer, but it really doesn't take an engineer to know that a system that is as old as ours is going to have major problems. It's old, it's crumbling, and it needs to be fixed. But when we talk about what is the most major problem there, the most major problem there is that none of us know exactly what the major problem is. Now, had it not been for that flood in August, we still wouldn't know that those pumps were working, but the people that were in charge, never have to, they never mentioned that. So had it not become apparent with that just rain, not a hurricane, just rain, we would all be still in the dark. So the reality of it is, before we even get to start digging up the streets, we need to actually get into the books to find out just what's there. 
So before anything happens, we've got to put a mechanism in place to actually go and see what is in existence today. Now, again, we know that the system is old and has to be replaced, but before you even get to started with the system, you've got to replace the management and the management style to create public accountability and transparency. I am uh, an architect at Darnellis. I still work with FEMA. Actually, when I leave the space today, tomorrow I'll be in an interview where FEMA is trying to send me over to Florida and parts where we've had the storm. But I, this, this is just from my notes that I've made working for FEMA over the last 15 years. We need to develop uh, a flood risk management strategy that identifies and implements measures to reduce the risk over uh, that reduce the overall risk and, and what remains the re re residual risk. In developing this strategy, those responsible judge the cost and benefits of each measure. In New Orleans, most of the issues with uh, the Swede and Water Board, some of it is, fun is funded by FEMA, but we also have a hazard mitigation program that, that basically allocates money to issues like pumps and how we do flood and water management. So being a, uh, the, the being a member of the city council, we need to have people basically who are resourced in this particular me mechanisms. We need to have people who have uh, an idea of what hydrology is about and basically have those people serve on the city council at the, at the request of the mayor. This is how we basically uh, resource this uh, uh, particular issue. Thank you. Uh, I would demand immediately uh, that the mayor does a complete audit of the system, that the mayor goes ahead and finds someone that actually has experience with water management. I think that's low-hanging fruit. Um, one of the most fundamental things, it's not necessarily always the pumps, but it's the power source to these pumps. We shouldn't have to rely on energy coming in and spending tens of millions of dollars having to put supplemental power in. These are the kind of inefficient things we do in New Orleans because we don't invest in the long term. And we're trying to do quick fixes. I'm very concerned about the antiquated pension system there, $700,000 payoffs, $175,000 um, pensions in perpetuity. This is not good modern government. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to modernize that system. Right now, one of the things with the pumps is we have these pumps all across the city, but they're not digitized. They're not connected to each other. We've got to modernize that. Not necessarily the pumps, but at least the monitoring of them. And we've got to get all the different entities of government. I'll talk about this when we're talking about public safety. We're talking about infrastructure. We've got to get people to cooperate and coordinate with each other. Public works has to be on the same page as Sewage and Water Board. I will work with the New Orleans delegation that goes to Baton Rouge and try to get something done legislatively to change this system. Uh, quick follow-up question. What is your favorite recipe for boiled tap water? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move to affordable housing. Rent could, you, could you elucidate on the question, boiled tap water? <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in the question, that's why I asked. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, moving to affordable housing. Renters need to earn $18.54 per hour to afford a modest two-bedroom apartment in New Orleans. That is more than the typical renter earns and more than twice what minimum wage workers earn. With so much of people's income spent on rent, they are unable to build long-term wealth for their families and are unable to participate fully in the city's economy. In conditions like these, how do New Orleanians in low, moderate income households build wealth for themselves and their families? And we'll start with Mr. Ray. Hmm, that's a, a, a very nuanced uh, question there. It's hard to say how they can actually build wealth when this, the, the deck is stacked against them like that. Um, there are things that we can do from the city council that can help to alleviate that. Um, one is your know, housing costs now incorporates what you pay for rent or for your mortgage also incorporates your utilities and your energy bill. And the city council directly regulates and sets energy rates, uh, utility rates in the city. 
Uh, one thing that we could support more of is the Energy Smart Program, which uh, helps homeowners and households to uh, kind of green, greenerize their home, I could use that word, and it saves them uh, on their out-of-pocket expenses for your energy utility bill. That's one thing you can do. Uh, another thing, though, is you know, cities, some cities, uh, have financial literacy programs where they are actually uh, helping their citizens or offering services to their citizens in financial literacy, helping them to learn how to save, how to invest, how to teach savings to their children. It's not something that's maybe talked about in a lot of families, especially in black families, but it's something I think that the city could kind of facilitate a little bit more. The way the system is set up right now, if you're poor, you're going to stay poor, and your kids are going to stay poor. There's no way you're going to be able to build wealth. Housing problems right now, 65% of the people don't pay any kind of property tax. That falls back onto the people who own the houses and most of the people who rent the houses. 10% of the people pay those, home, pay those property taxes. Until that changes, that's going to be the way it's going to stay. And it's only getting worse. And the problem is, well, I've got a real big problem with Airbnb. I want them out of our city. Somehow they got in and they got in. As soon as Airbnb, the number of Airbnbs went up, housing, housing availability went down, and the rentals also went up. That's the goddess, that's anathema to me. Can't happen anymore. We need to remove the homestead exemptions completely across the board. People will be happy with it. I have a homestead exemption. I'll be willing to give up mine because we need to have more property taxes come in so it'll make more affordable housing available for the people of the city of New Orleans. We have an overabundance of blighted properties throughout the city, particularly uptown. One of the things that I could do to start the process to make people sustainable is that we need to untie the mess of blighted properties that we have. Now, those properties that are now sitting there doing nothing but being nuisances, we need to investigate the possibility and the reality that we can put them into commerce. We can put those houses into commerce to make affordable housing available now. You will not only help the tax base by putting those properties back into commerce, but you sustain the community because home ownership brings stability. Now, too many people don't have the opportunity to get into houses, especially uptown now. Property values have soared, but we've got a wealth right now. It's way too many of them that are sitting there doing nothing. Why don't we just look at it for what it is, untie those, and make them available to low-income people to live in, and you create home ownership and economic stability. You don't create home. <clears throat> you, you do not create home ownership in New Orleans by basically levying this nuisance tax on people. Uh, before I came here, there was a program that we worked in the, that we did in New York, which was, which was called a sweat equity program. This concerns uh, um, housing. When you're talking about blighting housing, where people basically could actually go to the city uh, of New York, who was set up a revolving loan program to borrow money to fix those properties, and if they stayed in it for five years, they were forgiven the loans and basically the city was able to basically recoup, recoup a lot of the uh, property taxes that way. Another thing that we uh, uh, have to look at is that when we're talking about affordable housing, it really has to be affordable and we have to look at smart mixed-use housing. So the developers that come into the community, they're getting community development plus grants, but also we have to remember that those, those are the taxpayers' money that they're actually using to build these properties. We need to have a moratorium for five years that when people come into those neighborhoods, and I'm talking about developers, that renters in those particular neighborhoods have their rent on a, on a hold for five years and does not go up. That's how you create people who are property owners. Thank you. Thank you. I think with affordable housing, there's a lot of actors at play here uh, that could take up you know, hours to discuss. But I think this question specifically dealt with the minimum wage. And I know in this community, in Mid-City I'm talking about, not all a district B, affordable housing is a huge issue now. I know short-term rentals affect it, but I think specifically with a minimum wage increase is so necessary. I've lobbied in Baton Rouge for various educational things, being on the OPSB, whether it's early childhood development and so forth. I will lobby that I think it's embarrassing that we're pegged at a federal standard of seven and a quarter. I'm for a significant incremental raise of the minimum wage 
cost of living is soaring, and at the same time, our jobs are not keeping up with it. So I think we need to really dig in and look at how we can increase pay and demand that our businesses do that, incentivize that our businesses are spending more money on our people. And I know in certain areas, this has become a huge problem. I've seen the polls, I've seen the numbers, and I've canvassed and talked to people in this area and all across District B and all across the city. We've got to find a solution. There's so many issues at play here, but certainly increasing one's individual income is very key to this. So there are two sides to affordable housing. There's the people's ability to create income that can allow them to afford the normal demand and increase in, 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 in living expenses. And then there's mandating or controlling or somehow protecting the raising cost of living. We do have a lot of blighted property and there are limited equity co-ops. Inclusionary zoning, a lot of people love to talk about inclusionary zoning because it's such a pretty word. Um, it actually doesn't work. Uh, I'll challenge you to Google it. Within 35 minutes, you'll find five studies across the country that have been done by multiple universities that inclusionary zoning actually is detrimental to protecting affordable housing. But if we create limited, co limited equity co-ops, um, this is a way for people to buy into, they can actually, it's a transition mechanism or strategy to get them out of renting and into ho home ownership. And you do it, it's all over New York. You have the limited ones, you have the private ones. It's on my platform, it's hard to talk about in one minute, but it's on in detail on my website, so check it out. All right, in light of some of the questions, I'm actually gonna jump off script and go to one of the other uh, questions that were presented to you all uh, earlier. I think I'm gonna paraphrase it a little bit. You all have talked about getting uh, blooded properties back into commerce. In light of existing constitutional property uh, right issues, in light of restrictions on the seizure of public or uh, private property for public purposes, what would you actually do in order to get these blooded properties back into commerce? Thank you. This is a fantastic idea that I'm very excited about talking to you. We have about 30,000 blighted properties in the city of New Orleans. Let's talk about that. We can use these blighted properties as vocational training centers for children 12, 13, 14, and get them to work under uh, journeymen, master craftsmen. They'll learn every aspect of the flooring to the ceiling, carpentry, electrical, plumbing, tile work. Then after they've fixed these houses up, they'll have vocational training that'll follow them for the rest of their lives, because not everyone wants to go to college, but everyone should have an equal chance at some sort of training for jobs. So then you have children with jobs, you have new houses that they can go to um, first time homeowner, homeowners, uh, section eight people, people who need help, and musicians can have these houses. The city gets rid of the blighted property. Then you have homes, you have affordable housing, and you have people who are training these children getting paid for their work. Four wins, win, 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 win. I love this part of this job. Thanks guys. Right, before you pass it on, I can go back to the question. The question is, how does the government actually take control of these properties in the first place? These are owned by individuals. There are restrictions on the government's ability to seize the property. What ideas do you have to bring to the table to allow the government to get those properties? We have to, well, that has to do with lobbying the city and, this, and up in Baton Rouge to get the ideas of letting these people who can't be found to find their, their houses or who's in the line of who owns this in the line of succession to be able to, if you can't find the house or you can't afford to take care of the house and become the blight for the city, then you have to be able to take these properties from the people who no longer are there, can't be found, and then return them to a use for the public and for the people of the city. There are actually two sides to the problem issue because there are properties that are already under the city's control that have already been adjudicated. Now, I'm not in favor of just taking people's houses who don't have the ability to fix them. What I would propose to do is use CBDG funds to float loans to those homeowners that let them renovate them. What happens now is we end up taxing and feeing people out of their houses because they cannot maintain them, they can't keep them up, and you're putting those, well, I'm gonna call them nuisance fines and fees on them to the point where they exceed the value of the house because we find them so much. They can't come back and renovate it because before they can get the title as clear, they gotta pay those fees. And at the end of the day, you're just chasing your tail because They'll never get the money to be able to pay the fees and renovate it. So as long as they aren't doing anything with it, it's sitting there. So let's 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 come at it from the beginning. Let's help them by getting the resources in place, and you can use CGBG money as the backstop for that 
to help them renovate it. Now, the ones that are already owned by the city, let's put them back in the commerce. Let's take them away from the agencies that have them and get them into renters that want to become homeowners and help them to renovate them. Can I get that question again? We talked about okay, blighted properties. Yeah. The question is, the government doesn't have carte blanche ability to just seize private property. What programs and what methods would you use in order to help get these blighted properties back into commerce? Well, at the moment we have, um, I think we have NORA and we have um, some other non-profit agencies that basically are getting a lot of private properties uh, and are basically not putting them to use. This is why uh, earlier on I talked about the sweat equity program that we can in initiate in the city to basically uh, create a, a fund in the city that we, you know, we have lo we have a lot of developers that are going after low-income housing tax credits. We have a lot of developers going after Hope Six lands. We have a lot of developers going after uh, community development block lands. We can put that in a pool and have people who basically really want to go back and resuscitate those properties go into that pool are able to get funds to fix those properties. And if we forgive those loans after five years, as long as the people stay on those properties, what we actually do is create a tax base for the city. Those properties are, are basically resuscitated. We are eliminating blight, blight. And that is a program that we should really uh, look at seriously. It's called being proactive. Thank you. Well, blighted property is certainly a problem. I'm an advocate for getting it back into the tax base. However, it can be a complicated issue. You know, at the end of the day, here we're trying to preserve the authenticity of our neighborhood. So, with blighted, blighted properties, I have to be cognizant of my preservation friends and look at them. I mean, are these projects or these homes that we can rehabilitate? Are there ones that we can di disassemble and rehabilitate? Or, at the worst cost, can we demolish them? And I guess as far as, you know, you know the, the worst offenders in this is absentee landlords. So I guess, Graham, to answer your question, it's about code enforcement. It's about some of the laws that we have on the books already and making sure, especially absentee landlords, if you live in another city and you're not keeping up with your property, then you should lose your property. You should be fine. You should be pushed into a governmental system that actually takes actions and pushes this along. So those are some of the philosophies I have. But I, I think we don't do very good, a good job in code enforcement across the city in many things. So I'm really looking forward to having to push those issues. I'd like to set up more programs for succession when people, heirs, don't know who owns the property. That's a big thing. And there's already some programs that are doing that, but I'd like to see that expanded a bit. So I met with Code, code, code Enforcement, and I mean, they're understaffed, and the legal bureaucracy that goes through to actually figure out who owns a property, even enforce the codes, it's, it's, it's absurd and ridiculous. But there has to be, and, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong because you're the attorney, I think at some point in time, there, there is a time frame in which it's considered abandoned. Is that not correct? I mean, you don't know. Years. Okay. There, I, I think there is a time frame long in which... period of time. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. when it is abandoned, there's still restrictions on the ability right. to transfer that title to other individuals, which is outside of the question. Right. So... The, at some point in time, I know with abandoned animals, it's a little easier. But obviously, there needs to be a system where once a property is considered abandoned, we have ability. If we can't do it into a government, maybe we can do it into a citizen's co-op or a neighborhood association, give somebody else an opportunity to take over the proper property that's not necessarily a government. How exactly that would work out, we have to sit down and figure out the legal code enforcement deals with it on a daily basis. And real quick, I'm going to be fast. As far as the ones owned by city council, um, one of the most impact ways is to actually invest those homeowners and help them renovate their property. <laughs> um, so there, there are a few things that, that happen already. There are a few processes that are already in place. One is the share of sale. That's a mechanism by which certain properties can be adjudicated um, and people can't, you know, either own or acquire, I guess, the, the tax rights still by paying back these property taxes on properties, or in some cases, they can actually acquire property or be in possession of properties um, to title. Another way, though, is uh, what they call demolition by neglect. It's a kind of a legal maneuver that involves code enforcement and HDLC kind of working kind of hand in hand there. It's, as, as Graham said, it's, it's a pretty tedious process. I, I clerked in the civil court for a while. Um, Many of the post processes there are, are pretty long, but this um, is a mechanism that we have to, if they're uh, probably uh, unoccupied blighted properties, you can 
the code enforcement through fines and fees, once those things kind of build up, there, there are ways that you can then make, uh, I guess, some strides to get them from the property owners. Louisiana, your property is a very big part of our, our, our civil code, and it's not really that easy to just take someone's property, even if it is blighted. But code enforcement is one way that you can um, attach fines and fees to it. Okay, great. We're going to move on a little bit to uh, affordable housing. So, uh, a new Enterprise Community Partners Housing NOLA and GNOF poll indicates housing is the second leading issue uh, voters want to, candidates to address in this election. Do you have any experience with New Orleans' lack of affordable housing, and how has that experience impacted your perspective on the affordability issue? My mom lives uptown on the old strip. Right across the street from her, a house that I uh, watched my entire life just sold for $450,000. That's a great thing for the family that sold it, but for the people around there, now their taxes are going to go up exponentially. That is patently unfair. Now, what I'm proposing is that we freeze assessment at the Katrina rates. And I realize the council doesn't have the power, we've got to let a lot of the legislature to do it. But at the end of the day, we've got to be able to protect the residents that are here. I welcome all the new people coming to New Orleans. I think it's great. But the residents that have been here have to be able to stay here. And if you push them out, we're going to lose New Orleans that, that we have. Now, New Orleans is the most magical place on the planet, but I'm going to tell you, people come here for the culture. They come here for all that we do, the food and the music. But ain't no pot of red beans ever cooked itself. Ain't no horn ever blew itself. It's the people here that do that. And if the people that provide those services can't be here, we ain't gonna have the New Orleans that we love. So yes, I am absolutely, adamantly, trying to find any solution we can to make sure that residents that have been here for generations are allowed to stay here. As an architect, the, uh, I, the idea of me coming to New Orleans actually uh, looking at uh, infrastructure development. I have been here for 12 years and I've built probably over 400 units. I've been involved in uh, from uh, B.W. Cooper all the way down to uh, uh, the Columbia Park uh, apartments and also the um, uh, anyway, uh, let, me, let, me, let me go on. Um, when, we, when we're looking at uh, affordable housing in the city, um, I, I was looking at a question uh, you offered, offering tax rates for new developments. But what we have seen in New Orleans is that a lot of developers are coming here, they're getting those tax breaks, but is it basically trickle, trickling down to people who really are indigenous residents of New Orleans? We have to have community benefit agreements. The community has to be at the table when new affordable housing is done so that affordable housing is affordable and people who basically have basically resourced and basically put energies into developing those communities are not gentrified out of those communities. We need to do that. Thank you so much. All of these issues we talk about tonight kind of all are connected, and, and certainly it's a concern to me where employees of mine and friends of mine are talking about rents that they paid 10 years ago are now tripled. Um, I've talked to a lot of people in my neighborhood that said, you know, I bought this house in 1975 for $30,000, and uh, now my taxes have gone up four, four or five fold since Katrina. So I think we need to look at, you know, tax abatements, senior uh, abatements, and doing all sorts of things to keep uh, people safe here and keep people in housing. I think one of the biggest concerns I have, and it connects with the transportation issue, is that our labor force is being pushed out of uh, District B, which is really the economic engine of the city, other than the French Quarter. And I think that's something that needs to be talked about, is that the Central Business District, the Warehouse District, the Superdome, the Convention Center, these are all in District Bs, and pushing our labor force out almost exclusively because of affordable housing issues is very troubling. And then compiled with that, the fact that we have such a you know, meager, public transportation system is really putting a lot of people in really serious uh, positions. I mean, District C is not part of ours, but I listen to the people that are friends of mine that are in Algiers and having to take 90 minute rides to get to work in the CBD. It's a problem. So I think we're all affected by affordable housing for exactly what Seth said, whether you're personally affected or whether it's the people you depend on or you know your workforce that's affected, it all affects us. And we have an ex extremely lenient 
home charter, home world charter. And even though the state sets the assessments, I've lived in cities, in Maine, for example, that actually have a city ordinance that prevents, allows you to tell the assessor he's not allowing your property. Then he has to assess your property at the previous value. We can pass, we have a home rule charter for a reason. I think this is a perfect example where we can use it and set up our own city rules that protect our citizens from increased property taxes because somebody decides to build a mansion next to them. That also maintains our rents because if you have somebody that has rental property, the rents go up as the cost of operations go up. So if we can keep all these costs down for the ones that are here all the time and not necessarily the ones that are wanting to come in and build giant McMansions, we can help maintain. But I think we should use our home charter rule and set our own rules. So I, I live in my family home, uh, the home that I grew up in, and it's in Broadmoor. And I can tell you that if we didn't own our home before Katrina, we would not be able to afford to live there now. Uh, same goes for many members of my family, many of my friends who have uh, become locals because they love this city, they moved here from other places, came for college or law school or grad school, and they remain here also. Are, you know, if you can't live on your own, you have to have a roommate, you have to have a spouse or something, or something to help with the cost of rents or, or mortgages in New Orleans. One thing that I think we should do about that though, uh, especially when it comes to new developments, if you look at any of the places downtown in the CBD, the warehouse district, those are new developments, and those are all priced outside of probably everyone, most people in this room cannot afford to live in any of those new developments. One uh, proposed that's, that's but for, for the current council which they're going to act on is the Smart Housing Mix Ordinance, which would require new developments to reserve a portion of their units and dedicate those at affordable rates, which I support. When I got here to New Orleans in June of 2005, I moved into an Irish Channel neighborhood and I loved it because it was so diverse and the people there, there were three ladies who were in their 90s on my block. And I, I loved that. And I was a young kid on the street, my young family. And then after the storms happened, everyone moved out from my block except me. I'm the only one who's been in my street since before the storms. And I could see how that affected the neighborhood because people couldn't afford to stay there anymore. And on the positive side, you know, people came in and they redid all the houses and now they're living in nice houses and fantastic and everyone has a beautiful street now. But the negative part is that the people who were the backbone that drew me to live there, to my wife and my child to stay in this house, those people are gone and they've been replaced by good people, but the point is the community that brought me there is gone. I want to reduce those property taxes to, like, like Mr. Banks said, to what we had before Katrina to let the people who still have their homes be able to maintain their homes, because that is what the integral part was that drew me to this neighborhood in the first place. Thank you. Okay, something similar on the land use. Many candidates have said the issue of short-term rentals need more study. Despite a whole lot of studying, the issue has been done already. In addition to seemingly endless first-hand accounts, community residents and investigative journalists have done deep dives into short-term rental data and presented their findings in print and public meetings. Which studies are you looking at when you consider this issue, and what does the current data tell you so far? What specific data is still needed, if any, for you to take a policy stance? And we'll start with Mr. Ben. Say that again, I'm looking at a question. I don't, I don't, I, I mean, question 23. 23, okay. It's really, it's, re it's really your stance, it's your stance on short-term rental and do you need additional data to come up with your stance on short-term rental? <coughs> What do I think about short-term rentals? And would I, would I need additional data? I do need additional data. But um, I think um, my issue with that is that um, we are living in a city that has 
become very unaffordable for many of the citizens who I came here to meet when I came here in 2005. Uh, the taxes have gone up, the uh, property tax have gone up, uh, uh, fines have gone up. Um, most people are doing between two and a half to three jobs to basically pay nearly 60% of AMI of what they're earning. Why are we living in New Orleans that is this way? Why is the city council not getting uh, uh, involved in making sure that we have a moratorium on how much landlords can, can, can basically um, squeeze out of renters for the amount of space that they're renting? We, we have to look at those issues. I've not looked at this question very well, but uh, I'm sure that a lot of people who sit in this room agree with me that this particular part of the world is getting very unaffordable. Uh, I've yet to make, meet anyone that really is gung-ho about short-term rentals that doesn't own them. Um, I've said this about other things with affordable housing, but I think it deteriorates the, uh, the authenticity of our neighborhoods. I think we have to be very careful with Airbnbs and short-terms. Having said that, I don't think New Orleans is different than any other city in this respect. So I think Airbnb is here to stay, and I wouldn't vote or support something that would completely ban it. Having said that, I'd like to see a universal policy. You can't cut out the French Quarter and then not cut out Mid-City or not cut out the Lower Garden. So I'd like to see a consistent policy across the city. And as far as the data goes, I'd like to continue to monitor it and see how neighborhoods feel about it. Uh, I've walked around these neighborhoods and I've seen the big permits in front. And someone said to me, you know, this used to be a great neighborhood for, for people, for affordable housing, for mid-level housing. And now it's, you know, it, it's become a, um, a boarding house. So I'm very concerned about that. And I'm, my, key is, my idea is to regulate it. We've already put the taxes on the books, we put the regulations on the books, but from what I understand, we're not enforcing it anywhere but in the French Quarter where it's completely banned, and I don't think that's fair. So I think the side of affordable housing that we forget is uh, my nanny, who's amazing by the way, you can't have her yet, um, is a kindergarten teacher. She's a low to moderate income earner, because unfortunately I know how much I pay her. She owns a shotgun, a double shotgun. She lives in one side, and the only reason she can afford to stay there is because she short-term rents out the other side. We have to remember that side of affordable housing. What we hate about affordable housing are the ones that take advantage of it. The ones that live out of state come in and buy a block of properties, destroy the integrity of our neighborhood, and just make a profit off of us, and then don't even spend the revenues here. They spend them in Ohio or Chicago. So what I would like to see is, I, I do not agree with Seth in that I think it should be universal. Every neighborhood has different needs. I think it needs to be highly community involved. I think our community organizations should have voting rights on this situation. And I think we need to come up with a flexible program with a set of regulations that can be applied individually per neighborhood based on the neighborhood needs. Um, everything from, okay, it's on my website. You can look it up. <laughs> Uh, I don't need to see any more studies about uh, short-term rentals. Um, most of my, like the first three months of the campaign were spent knocking on doors and meeting with residents. And the consensus is pretty clear that short-term rentals have devastatingly impacted the quality, the integrity, the fabric, the culture of New Orleans neighborhoods. And I have a friend, Eric, who lives in Tremaine, and uh, I probably shouldn't say his name because it's being recorded, but he lives in Tremaine. And <laughs> Uh, he told me there are only two people now who actually live on his block. So if you could imagine being on a block where there are only two occupied houses, or two habitually or regularly occupied houses, that's not a neighborhood. That's not somewhere you really want to move or want to live. Um, I found consensus on amending and banning whole home rentals. That's something I can say today I would support on a council, I would help to Reauthor or re, uh, restructure the short term of the ordinance to ban whole home rentals. Um, there can be exceptions, perhaps, for home exemptions, but that's a little more nuanced. But as Catherine said, my website has much more detail about it. I think the idea of short term rental is basically what Catherine said is people being able to rent out part of their homes temporarily or something like that. But then it's been abused. And it has been remarkably affordable, or rather, I'm sorry, remarkably fiscally uh, beneficial for people who don't live here, as opposed to the people who are going to make a little extra money on big weekends. And uh, I am against the expansion of the Airbnb system specifically, because it does 
negatively impact the communities in which they function. That being said, I would much rather these, uh, these short-term rentals be used for people who are living here in, in Broadmoor, in the, the Irish Channel, places like that that we live, rather than people, Bob and Mary, coming down from Atlanta for a weekend and spending their money here and then taking it off. Now, I'm, I, I think short-term rental needs to be much more strictly enforced and re-looked -looked at again because it doesn't, it doesn't benefit the people of the community. I support short-term rentals only for homeowners. I think that the law needs to be rewritten. I think that the permit to have a short-term rental ought to be tied to a homestead exemption. Now, if Ms. Jones needs to rent out her room to help her ends meet, I'm okay with that. I am vehemently opposed to people creating many hotels throughout our city. That is what's happening. Now, conceptually, Airbnb and short-term rentals, whatever you want to call them, they're not going anywhere. We need to do a much better job on making sure that it does not negatively impact the surrounding neighbors. Again, if it's tied to the homestead exemption, then you know the people that are going to be affected by it have to live there. What you've got now is people that never have to deal with the trash, never have to deal with the noise, never have to even be concerned about how these people deal with their neighborhood because they're not their neighborhood. If we tie to homestead exemptions, I think it'll be a much better way to go. Our next question goes back to public safety. The New Orleans Police Department is under a consent decree with the U.S. Department of Justice and has undergone extensive reforms. Many of these reforms were desperately needed and were demanded by citizen activists for years before the DOJ got involved. Which consent decree mandated by, or, excuse me, which consent decree reform do you believe has been the most successful and which reform still has the most work left to be done? I think we'll start with Mr. Blue. Having the Inspector General in an organization, whether it's Municipal or Traffic Court or whether it's the OPSB, is not popular. It's extremely burdensome to these organizations. Having said that, we've had such a lack of transparency and dysfunction that I'm a supporter of the Inspector General and the consent degree within a time period. But I think hopefully, especially with dealing with the NOPD, it has, with things like dash cameras, body cameras, has provided more transparency. As a criminal defense lawyer, I would hear the stories of my clients getting arrested, and they can't all be lying to me. Certainly some of these people have had too much to drink, but having, to, having said that, the inconsistency of the behavior and the problematic uh, behavior of the police department is something that was, well, was very problematic of the stories I heard, especially about 10 or 12 years ago. So I think it was a necessity to have the consent decree in place. But I will say it, it, it's a burdensome process to work within an area of government that has this going on. So I think we need to restrict it to a certain timeline and hopefully get people in place permanently that are local within the community to actually run our own different entities of government for the long term. So the goal of the consent decree is obviously constitutional policing and I think we're all in support of that. Um, the accountability and transparency across the board from the consent decree is, think, is what we wanted. I think it's what we want in a lot of our departments. I wish we could have a consent decree for sewage and water board. <laughs> but one place that I think is probably the most impactful is the idea of profiling. You watch all these criminal shows and profiling has a purpose and a place. You profile somebody based on behaviors that make you um, realize who they would be and where you would find them, but not based on skin color you, and not based on height and not based on weight and not based on eye color. Understanding how profiling really works, and that's something that I think we need to train into our police force that stays there. Um, we need to be able to know that the, the, the spirit of the consent decree is gonna continue, so that we're not gonna have random people being pulled over because of the way they look, but more they're gonna be pulled over because there's a reason that they have a propensity, or there's an understanding that there's a possibility of a crime, or a real crime that has happened. 
Uh, one of the, I think the better reforms um, that I think we can be proud of with our NOPD clinical consent decree is the reduction in the use of force. We had a, a, just a, a systemic problem with complaints about excessive force by NOPD officers during arrests and during stops. And I think the consent decree has helped to bring those numbers down. If you were in New Orleans before Katrina or even immediately after, you remember it was a very, very dark time for our police department. And I think the reforms from the consent decree have helped to um, usher in a new day, a new dawn of, of transparency, but also of a, a force that operates with a little more of a, I guess, a, a clear, clear focus and clear path. Um, kind of weed out some of the more corrupt officers and practices and have a long, a long way to go. One area that we could improve upon, though, I think, could be to maintain our standards in, in recruitment. Um, we, we see that sometimes we don't always recruit the best officers. Sometimes we recruit officers who would not be able to pass the muster in other parishes. I think there was a recent, even a recent article about that that uncovered, uh, I think, about five recruits that kind of slipped in. So those are two things. The, the consent decree came into being because our police department lost the privilege of being able to police itself. One of the things that I think is a fantastic addition to that is the body cameras and the microphones in the cars and on the police officers themselves. Because cameras and microphones are unbiased and they're going to record what's happening and they're going to tell the real story without any kind of objections. One, this is a very difficult situation because the police have an incredibly difficult job. And they're not doing it because of money, they're doing it because of a passion, because of a calling that they want to serve the public. I'm hoping that this is gonna be something that we can let go and that we can maintain our own integrity as a police department. But right now we're not ready for that. Right now there needs to be more oversight because the transparency is not there. And we need to have full transparency and accountability for our police officers who are there to protect us and not persecute us. Thank you. I think that the part of the decree that has worked best is community policing. Now, many of you all in, the, in here don't live in communities where the police are feared. But in the community that I live in, that was a real thing. We had children that were afraid of the police. Now, they're afraid of the bad guys, but they're afraid of the police also. And what has happened with the community policing component is put police in positions where you have allayed some of that fear that the community had. I work at the drive line, see, I work with kids every day. We've got officers that are now looked at as assets and friends by those kids who before were afraid and when they'd see them, they'd run from them because they'd heard all the stories about the abuse that had taken place previously. Now, have we come as far as we need to come? No, the degree needs to stay in place. But are we on the right road? Yes, we are. And I think the police force is getting better. I think that the community is relating to them better, and I think that the consent decree has had some benefit. My understanding of the consent decree that is, is, is that it was crafted to promote constitutional policing by calling to clear uh, by calling clear policies that give officers meaning, meaningful guidance. And looking at that, I was thinking because I live uh, in the same uh, neighborhood or in the same area as Jay lives, I looked at uh, training. I looked at practices to our department, use of force and dis discriminatory policing. Especially in predominantly African American communities, I think these are issues that uh, not only we have to take, take the task, but that there are issues that basically permeate the whole community. And as Jay, and as Jay just said, I have talked to younger people who live in the um, Central City community who, who tell me that uh, uh, policemen are no friends of theirs. So we have to begin to look at um, community policing and look at the relationship between the police and younger people in our community to develop trust. Thank you. Okay, we're just gonna jump back to land use regarding the master plan. Um, so over 8,000 citizens participated in development of the New Orleans Master Plan, and the Master Plan is supposed to have the force of law in helping direct future development in the city. 
Yeah, we often see council approving land use decisions that are inconsistent with the master plan, uh, sometimes over uh, citizen objections. What are your thoughts on the master plan and how it has been used by city council to guide decision making? So the master plan should actually set the policies and the CZO is the legal tool that is supposed to be used to enforce the master plan. And there's two major flaws with how our system is set up because the legal authority behind the master plan is not there. One reason is because the city council is not required to adopt it and there's no legislation or ordinance that requires any um, land use to comply with the master plan. So that's exactly where I would start. I would make sure that as a city council, we adopt the master plan officially and we create a city ordinance that requires all, all decisions to be made in align with the master plan. And that's what you do with a CZO. And our CZO is failing in that area. So the current master plan is um, kind of a, a pulse between the iteration that was kind of developed with, as you said, thousands of, of, of citizens who came to several meetings. I was at some of those as well uh, for District B. And you know, on, on the one hand, it, it's a good guide for our city. On the other hand, I think it had there been some some pretty good amendments to it. And you know, I I don't want to say that I can sit here and say we should be locked into something permanently just because we agreed to this ten years ago. For instance, we thought that building three lane highways or two lane roads was enough for our city, and we've seen that it had to grow. It has expanded our interstate. Same thing as the Havasu and Water Board. We built this great system that was state of the art back in the 1930s and 40s, and now it's, it's old and antiquated. Um, so I think the master plan is something that we have to keep working with, working to get it right, and I don't see it as a, uh, a concrete, uh, you know, Ten Commandments set in stone, something that we should work with together uh, to make sure that it still reflects us, it still reflects who we are. The plan is just that. It's a plan, it's a guideline that we can use to move forward with our ideas, and we're gonna to have to be able to adjust them as that we see fit. The, the idea that it hasn't been completely approved by city council is something that impedes the fact that we can't put it into complete use. But the idea that we're gonna have these fantastic ideas that are, beg your pardon, we're gonna have these plans that are gonna be able to move us forward with more green spaces and more bicycle lanes are, are good ideas and we can use those but we're going to have to be able to also be amend these plans as we see fit. And right now, without any kind of steadfast understanding that this plan is in place and been voted on, we're not going to have the, the fluidity to change that subject when we get to the point that it's not working. So I think that we need to either adopt the plan and go for it 100% and see how it's going to work for us, or we're going to have to just change it and then adopt what we think is going to be the best plan for us. I support the concept of the master plan, but it has to come with the caveat that what's right today may not be right 10 years from now. So at the end of the day, we have to have the flexibility in order to be able to adjust it. So while its, it's intentions were all very, very good, and at the time when it's adopted, they may be all right, but who knows three or four years from now if that model is still in place. So while I would hope that we would act like it has the force of law, we have to be realistic enough to know that there's going to come a time when it has to be altered. Nothing today is the same way as it was 10 years ago. So while it's a game, it may be good right now, but I would not tell you that I would absolutely say everything in it has to be adhered to, to the letter because the circumstances may change and there may be a new nuance that has come into play that wasn't there when it was written. <laughs> when we talk about the master plan, uh, I don't go to New York to look for gumbo that's cooked in New Orleans. And so when we're here in New Orleans, uh, a lot of the implementations of the master plan was basically done by people who were not from the city of New Orleans. New Orleans has a rich vernacular of its architecture. And that's what basically makes it the, the, the city it is. 
and, and what brings the uh, uh, people to this part of the world to look at the architecture that most of us refer to as Louisiana Speaks Architecture. The, 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 the dichotomy of the architecture, the, the different neighborhoods that formed New Orleans, the planned unit development that was done by architects in the city, land planners in the city, before everybody else came here with the, with the idea that basically served the basis for architecture in Miami that did not work for people in, in New Orleans is still what we're suffering from. We have to go back to the drawing board and have an architecture that basically suffices for the people who live in this city and people who be begin to understand that neighborhoods they live in are not alien neighborhoods. Uh, the master plan is the master plan. I work with the master plan in education on the OPSB. Um, you know, a lot of energy, especially after Katrina was put into this. Experts, time, vigorous public debate. So I think it's important that we really follow the master plan. Of course there needs to be some degree of fluidity and some degree of flexibility to comport with changes in neighborhood associations. And as your city council person, I will always listen to those things. But we put so much energy and time into the master plan that we can't always do this in government. We make the long-term sacrifices the right way up front. They may be hard, they may not appease everyone, but we have to follow things that we ultimately think are gonna have a beneficial goal. So I'm gonna be hesitant uh, and I'm gonna need to hear compelling reasons to change the master plan because so much energy did go into that a few years ago. So I just want to say that you know our constitution is not a guideline, it's not it's it's law. And of course there's an amendment system. It's already in place, it's in place in Baton Rouge, it's in place with every city with a master plan. Of course it has the ability to be flexible and um, be changed. And like Seth said, there's a rigorous system around that. But if we don't enforce it with law now, it has no power, it has no validity. It's a waste of our time and a waste of our resources. And it doesn't preserve our it's history. It's hard to make a constitutional amendment. <laughs> so, since we're doing rebuttals now, uh, <laughs> 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 in, this, in, this, in, in this 30 seconds, uh, in this very building, we house our Orleans public defenders. If you go a few, a few floors up, you will see they have the most deplorable offices of any um, entity I've ever been to. And right now they're trying to move across the street to Tulane and go to the old Israel Augustine School, which was the Samuel J. Peter School before that. That's going to require amending the zoning, amending plans. So before we just say you know, that we can't do this because it's, it's our guide, understand that this very building, the very offices that are housing here, um, would we'll need amendments to have better space. The fact is that it may very well have been done with all the greatest intentions, but the reality of it is, is that the Constitution also has been amended. We will have to have the ability to make changes to the master plan as the circumstances dictate. And the example that Tim just gave is an absolutely wonderful one. We are going to have things that we did not foresee that are going to be coming that we're going to have to deal with. So no, it is not written in stone. It shouldn't be because you've got to have the flexibility to deal with things as they come up. My 30 second rebuttal is what I said before. Uh, <laughs> we don't want to live in a city that basically seems alien to us. You know, all it has a vernacular. And if we have a master plan that basically the people in the city of New Orleans still continue to fight against, maybe we need to go to the front drawing board and take their ideas. New Orleans is a city where custodians of the people and we need to listen to the people. Okay, this question is on infrastructure and transportation. Which bus route are you most familiar with? And which bus route did you ride most recently? <coughs> did you find RTA service acceptable? And we'll start with Mr. Ray. I guess I'm most familiar with the few bus routes because I would uh, drive the ride the bus to, to school when I was in high school, elementary school, parts of, part part of middle school, and uh, I even would use a streetcar going to law school because it was we had two hour zones around Loyola. Um, so. The last time I rode the bus, I think, was a few months ago, going to a transit meeting uh, at the World War II Museum. And it was interesting because um, 
as a kid, I just I guess we talked and we enjoyed the ride. We could get there when we got there. But when you actually have to be somewhere on time, uh, the buses are not as efficient. I use them all the time in Germany. I actually have a friend here who I met in Germany who now lives in New Orleans for a little while. Um, the German system is very, very, very different. It's very, very efficient. People use it. They rely on it for work. They rely on it for you know, doctor's visits, you know, school, all of that. Um, our system here could be a lot better with connecting people to jobs, perhaps have more efficient routes. And one of the things I propose are kind of more express routes that get people to and from uh, hotspot areas of, of uh, higher travel. Uh, the bus route that I'm most familiar with, that I just most recently rode, is the magazine line number 11. Uh, I've done some uh, sit-downs with the Ride NOLA people about how we can improve our RTA here. And we need to have 24-hour mass transit system. We're a major city and we don't have 24-hour bus lines. We need to extend the lines that we have. We need to create new lines. We need to have more covered seating areas, more seating areas. We need more e access to uh, disabled people and more bikes on the buses, as well as we need to have the cards so that you don't have to be have cash on your hand all the time. Because that's something that the old folks are worried about, getting knocked in the head and having their cash taken from them when they're standing at the bus. This is something that we can do by just maintaining the, uh, the bus lines. The one thing that I wanted to add for the green uh, ideas is that we want to have electric buses because our buses are about 12 years old. We need to replace them. We can have electric buses now and they'll cut down on the, uh, the pollution. It'll be just as more efficient and quieter. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> My last public transit experience was not a bus. It was a streetcar. We had some friends here who were visiting and we rode the streetcar down to the Mound Street and then the one from the Palace Cafe. Overall, I was very pleased because it got us there and got us back and it was a wonderful time to chat and enjoy the ride. Overall, though, we have a transit system that is in definite need of revamping. What happens to service industry people when they get off the work down in the quarter is terrifying. They've got to walk, sometimes a mile or two to get the bus, then wait for another hour and a half for a bus to come. Criminals are referring to those people as walking ATMs. RTA has to be restructured to become a real regional transit authority, not just something that's done in the daytime for a handful of people. We need to have those bus routes where people actually need them. They need to be able to run out to New Orleans East. They need to be able to run out to Algiers. And they definitely need to be available down in the quarter and downtown for the Goose that lays our golden egg, our tourism industry, for those workers. When they get off work, they have to have a way to get home. I recently went to an interview with uh, with Wright, uh, Wright New Orleans, and I was told this: uh, we have only recovered 42 percent of our pre-Katrina weekly bus trips, leaving fewer options for residents who can afford it. While the average New Orleans can can get to 89 percent of the region's jobs in 30 minutes by a car, they can only reach 11 percent of those jobs in the same time period by transit. In a city with high unemployment and poverty rates, and many residents without reliable access to a vehicle. That's unacceptable if we're serious about increasing access to economic opportunity. Now, we are also a city that basically lives on a lot of tourism. It, I think it's, it's uh, rather strange that we don't even have uh, a, a, a line, a, a monorail from basically the middle of uh, the city of New Orleans to the airport. And so in, 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 on a weekday, if you're challenged to try to go to the airport, it takes you almost two and a half hours where it was on a weekend, it takes you 15 minutes to get to the same airport. These are issues that we have to basically begin to invest a lot of time in. Um, like, like, Andre, I also, like Andre, I also live off of uh, Magazine Street, and Route 11 is my route, although I'm not going to patronize you, I've never taken a bus in the city of New Orleans. Uh, I've, I've taken a streetcar, and that's not because I don't like public transportation, it's because it's completely ineffective and not useful. So if you have a vehicle, why would you ever take one unless maybe there's a special event in the Superdome or something like that? I want to see a more robust public transportation system. The people in my area always are talking about the scheduling problems, the inefficiency, the untimeliness of the buses. So let's have a more robust, you know, my sister lives in Seattle, she sold her car. My cousins live in New York and Washington, D.C. They don't. They don't even own vehicles because it's such an efficient system. So I, I would welcome the idea 
not to have to pay car insurance and not to have to make a car payment every month and have an efficient system. And I certainly would like to see things like high-speed rails to Baton Rouge and to the airport and all that kind of good stuff. I'm not sure where the money's going to come from, but I'm certainly going to advocate for it and hope that we can have a you know robust transportation system at the very least have pre-Katrina levels of buses because the streetcars are nice, but they're, they're not effective for transportation for work. So I'm in the same boat as Seth. I've never taken a bus in New Orleans. Um, however, I lived in Berlin and Germany and uh, New York where I didn't own a car because of the transit systems. I didn't buy a car until we came back down here. Um, my nanny actually lives next door to you. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> but she takes the, the 11 bus to get to me. So I ask her all the time, what are the issues? She's been, ironically, quite pleased with them, but she takes one bus seven, eight blocks. She's not going into different parishes. She's not going to transits and changing. And I did the Ride NOLA um, interview as well. And there are some major issues. We don't have enough bus resources since Katrina. We have get along issues with other parishes that prevent us from having buses that trans that go across parish lines, which limits our ability to get people places. And then we don't use our resources in places that are, have the most impact, which drives me crazy, because return on investment. Aren't we, didn't we all take college economics? So we spend all this money on the rampart, and we've got less people getting to work. Makes no sense. I think this is going to be our last question, what I've been told. It's also an infrastructure question. Uh, we're in District B. Obviously, one of the resources here is the Lafitte Greenway. Um, it also runs through four council districts. All of the communities and the city as a whole will benefit from improvements like extension of the Lafitte Greenway to Canal Boulevard, safety and connectivity enhancements like the proposed Galvez streetscape pathways between the Greenway and University Medical Center, the development of community gardens, and the transformation of the brake tag station and sign and signal shop facilities. If elected, how will each of you make, the, make sure the council finds the resources and makes these priorities in the Lafitte Greenway Master Plan happen? How will you work with other council members to protect and build District B's assets like the Lafitte Greenway? Thank you. And I think we are starting with Mr. Rapp. So the Lafitte Greenway project is so far, a great project. I, uh, I think I'm the only person here who has not signed on to the Lafitte Greenway Pledge. Uh, and I'll tell you why. That's because I haven't had a chance to fully read all that's on the, on the site about it. But um, so far, I mean, I think it, it's a great project. It's a great asset for our city. It's not yet realized its full potential, but I think from what I've seen so far, the plans look really great for it. Um, it's a little more than just a, a bike path. And I think the, the, the vision, from what I've understood, is that it's going to be more than just a bike path, but actually uh, a very public space that could see so many things uh, that we use, that we see in, in other, other other cities. So I mean, I think something that I want to support, um, and I'm definitely looking forward to supporting more of the Lafitte Greenway projects as they go forward. I just don't know all of the plans that you have for that. If you imagine how many questionnaires we get every day, uh, we can't always get to them, so I apologize for that. But uh, I will answer it at some point soon. So, well, I, I I love the fact that it's got green in the title of it, and that's one of the things that made me read it immediately because I've I've been a big supporter of uh, alternative energies before I got into this full time. I was selling solar panels, so I love the idea that we're putting forth a, a, a big step forward in getting. New Orleans back towards being a green, or not toward, back towards, but towards a green city, because I, I have people come to visit from, well, of course, we all do, from all over the country, and, they're all, and the big thing is they're like, oh, you don't have enough green space, you don't have enough bike lanes, you know, and I, I'm very excited that we're going to be pushing this forward, so that I can tell the people from Seattle, shut up. <laughs> this is what we're doing here. I want to continue with the idea of recycling it. So I'm going to be a full throated supporter with all the district uh, the council members to keep this moving forward because we need this. Because New Orleans could be the greenest city in America in 20 years. We, can, we have wind power, we can have turbines, we have solar, we have all this at our disposal. We could just be a leader for this region and then the entire country. I'm excited about green technology. Can you tell? All right. <laughs> Now, I'm going to sound very stupid, but I didn't realize that the Lafitte Greenway was in District B. 
It's across Canal Street. I don't think that it's in District B. And I fully support the open space and the green space of it. But I, and not just here. I think we ought to have more open spaces and recreational areas throughout the district and throughout the city. And I will do what I can to help facilitate that. But I'm going to tell you, you all have enlightened me because I didn't realize that uh, the feet green were actually ran through B. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'm excited about this Lafitte Greenway every day, every minute, every hour. I'm a, I'm an avid biker. I do, uh, before I got sick myself and my wife do about 60 miles a week. But we, we were doing it from uh, the Osborne Park going all the way into St. John's Parish. So I, I basically appreciate that. I like the idea of urban renewal. I like the idea that we also tap tapping into environmental justice issues and concerns that basically most of the city needs to have been looking at since Katrina. Um, I think it taps into the issue of um, uh, carbon uh, tap, you know, uh, cap and trade for people who know uh, the issue about sustainability, about what we're trying to do here. But um, in New Orleans, uh, this is a city that really needs this particular resource, and I think I I applaud it. And I, I will support it as a council person because this is part of uh, what I dreamed when I came here to New Orleans uh, to settle down here. Thank you. You know, I think the, uh, the Levy Greenway, it's uh, an amazing example of a quality of life issue that we don't really talk about. Um, you know, we're so focused on public safety, we're so focused on infrastructure that some amazing projects like this can't exist, and I think we need far more of them all around the city. We should have more community gardens, we should have more rain gardens, and all these pieces are all connected together. So I, I champion this, I look forward to riding my bike on it, and I was just talking to some of the people that are here that I haven't yet, but uh, I'd like to see these, you know, create and link the entire city of New Orleans, and everything we can do to be green, or be more environmental, or be a leader, not only across the entire United States, but especially in the South, and especially in Louisiana, we're not doing a lot of these things, I think we can be we can demonstrate some real leadership in those things. So I'm a full supporter of that project and I'd like to see us carve out more money and lobby for more money in Baton Rouge and in Washington for other projects like this. Thanks. So I too am a supporter of the project. Um, I, I think the fact that it reduces the amount of non-porous concrete all throughout our city helps us manage stormwater. Um, it creates new alternatives to get to work because you can actually ride your bike into a different district, whereas some of these buses don't even cross district lines. Um, it improves the aesthetics, so there's the quality of life aspect of it. Um, I mean, it's, it's a great idea, and I actually think there's a way to ensure that we could maintain the funding for it. Um, one thing that we don't do here is across the board have a local hotel occupancy tax, including one Airbnb. So if you're gonna rent a room for more than $2 a night, there's a tax we could charge. Houston charges up to 7% just to rent a room. That's money we can then take and put back into our community because tourists are gonna use these areas too. So there's even an option to make sure that we can continue its funding. I don't think we've actually gotten through half of the questions that were generated by MCNO for the event, but we are out of time. So what we're going to do now is give each of you the opportunity to give a one-minute close. We're going to start on the right end and actually work our way backwards to the left and go the opposite direction that we did to, to start. So. Thanks, everyone, for staying out tonight and giving, us, giving me the opportunity to come out and here and speak to you all. Learning so much about the city during this campaign has been the greatest thrill of my life. I love going out and meeting people. I love listening to the stories. I love the idea of bridging these gaps as a communication person. I love the idea of being part of New Orleans and hearing the stories. One thing that I've learned that I wanna share with you is that everyone has a story and not everyone has a voice. So I get to listen to these stories and I get to lend their stories my voice and that is a privilege that I've enjoyed so much. My name is Dr. Andre Strumare. I'm Action Andre. I'm running for City Council District B. My number is 69. I'm so grassroots, I'm weeds. And I'm, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I just wanna say it's a privilege to sit up here with these, these absolutely fine people. And uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you very much. And thank you.
you all for staying. We want to thank uh, Kathy and Claire and Glam and, and, and Justin, who's one night for with the, the mic and one of the most polite timekeepers, always apologizing when he hits the, the bell for us. Um, if you see us smiling now, it's because this is our last forum together, and we are thrilled that it's kind of behind us. Um, as you all decided, you know, seriously, on, on who you want to represent you on the city council, after you take a look at not just the information you've been given uh, from my campaign, but also what's on my website, what others are saying about me, about my work, about my work ethic, about my policies, about the uh, time and attention I spend to details that are going to affect all of our lives, our residents, our, our businesses. Um, I was endorsed by Gambit not because I had the most money or because of the last the strongest machine behind me, but because they said they appreciate the depth and the policy and the detail that I, that I spent. Which is why I didn't sign up for Green Red, but I haven't read it. I'm not going to sign I don't know what's in it or what it says. And that's important, I think, to distinguish yourself as a person who's hardworking, who's true, who's honest, and who's sincere. So thank you for having me, and I'm uh, happy that this is our, our last forum. And Mid City, please go and vote because you have pretty low turnout numbers, but change that, all right? <laughs> So um, I'm Catherine Lovigan, and I would like to piggyback on what he said, because sitting through some of my encounters with city council, the one thing that stood out to me and frustrates me more than anything is when they come up with ideas or they spend our tax money and promote these programs, and it takes you 35 minutes on Google to find out they're not effective, um, or they don't work, or sometimes they're illegal. So I really think that we, and well, NOAA Patrol was an example of that one, um, but we need to have people that are willing to do the due diligence. They're willing to communicate with you in real time with clear, accurate information so that you are empowered as a citizen. You may not always hear what you want to hear, but it's important to hear what you need to know so that you can make the decisions that impact your community. And that's the leader and the city council member I want to be. A lot of people talk about their previous uh, um, political experience, but political experience does not make a leader. Understand that. I just wanted to thank everyone for having us out tonight. Um, I think this is where the rubber meets the pavement as far as politics go and real retail politics. So I applaud all of you and all of your organizations for putting this together tonight so as we can have a robust debate about uh, politics and the future of Mid-City and District B and overall the city of New Orleans. So this is not easy to do on a nightly basis and we've done a lot of these, especially ones that are two plus hours long. Uh, but you know, Mid-City people want to stay informed and I understand that. Uh, I've been battling a cold for a week, and from what I understand, this is what happens when you're uh, on a camp on the campaign trail. So I apologize tonight if my voice was a little weak, but uh, I can just tell you that I will work as hard as I can and be absolutely as fair as I can as a city council person. I'll work tirelessly to add leadership and transportation, tra transparency, uh, and transportation to the audience. It, it needs all of those things. So I, I'm committed to roll up my sleeves and do everything I can and really get your input. Because when people talk about what are District B issues, I say, well, what are New Orleans issues? We have everything in District B, so it's a really unique district. So thank you so much for having me out tonight, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll get your support. Thank you, uh, good people, for having us here today and uh, listening to uh, what we have and plans and answers and presentation ideas. Um, I came to this city 12 years ago, like I said, to do infrastructure development. I'm trained as an architect and as an environmentalist. You can find that on my website. I'm number 65. I think we have some cards, pool cards there. But I'm not going to go into platitudes and tell you about the impossible things that I can do. But I will tell you that when I sit in that office, if you elect me, I work for you for 24 hours a day. No call, it's not, it's too big for me to answer. I'll get out of bed to fix your, your street lights and I'm working. I'll get out of bed to make sure that your, 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 your potholes in the ground in your neighborhood are fixed. There's the attention that I, that I employ and engage people as consistent, uh, you know, people who work with me who basically engage you on a, on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, not on a monthly basis. But, but um, let me just very, let me just finish this by saying that deliberate, deliberately engaging those excluded from decision-making issues based on race, ethnicity, nativity, religion, sexual orientation, and disability status. Expanding the community voice, ownership, and power to effectively develop solutions that improve overall incomes, outcomes for all of you who stay here. This is what I will do when I, if, if you elect me as a council person. Thank you so much.
Good evening again and thank you. My name is J.H. Banks and I want to applaud you all for sitting through this. I really appreciate you taking the time. District B is the most diversified district that we have. You've got black, you've got white, you've got young, you've got old, you've got rich, you've got poor. We are a microcosm of everything here in New Orleans. It's gonna take a councilman that is able to listen and to hear from all of those diverse interests. Now I'm blessed enough to have been endorsed by both Republicans and Democrats, by both young and old, by both black and white, by Jews, by, by Catholics, by Baptists, by Muslims across the board. And the reason that is, is because I've been working in this community for almost 40 years to help people make their quality of life better. I'm lucky enough to have the endorsement of the governor of the state of Louisiana, the only candidate that he's gonna endorse in this race. I've got business endorsements, I've got labor endorsements. I've got those endorsements because of my ability to work with people across the board. I've got Republicans and Democrats because I've demonstrated an ability to build bridges, to work with coalitions, and to be able to communicate with people. And that is what you're going to need with an effective councilman someone who can communicate and work well with others. And I promise you I'll be a good councilman and you'll be able to count on me. Thank you so much, J.H. Banks, number 64. Thank you so much for this evening. As you can tell, pretty prompt. Uh, it's almost 8 o'clock. Um, again, one more round of applause for our candidates. Early voting starts on Saturday, and so please make sure you get out to vote. I hope this was informative for you this evening. Before you leave, be sure to grab some root beer or water, or if there's any food left. The garage closes promptly at 9, so if you are parked in the garage and it is 9.01, you're going to come back and get your car tomorrow. <laughs> Um, make sure you fill out those comment cards if you have any questions that weren't asked tonight. Uh, and please leave your email address with Mary at the information table. As we said at the beginning of this forum, we did send all of the questions out to the candidates. I've got proof. Um, so we're going to be sending them all of the questions that they didn't answer this evening, your questions as well. And we're going to get some written comment back from them, and we're going to disseminate that out to you. So look for that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.